This is CBC Here and Now. New pools, new daycare center, brand new facility. Hopefully uh, not much off a year from now, uh, we'll be uh, in the water. I'll take you inside and have a closer look at the construction of the new recreation center coming to Cornerbrook. We have a lot of really beautiful people in Indigenous history that could and should be celebrated. Celebrating a violent history, three solutions are being proposed for this for the future of this controversial statue near the Confederation Building. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. On what for many is a very special Canada Day long weekend, we'll get to those stories shortly, but first, registered nurses are getting a new deal. After a lengthy negotiation with the province and this statement on the lawn of Confederation Building last week, both sides have reached a tentative agreement. It includes a pay raise and more details are expected this week. The Minister of Health calls it a significant step towards retention. Nurses have said, they've been hung out to dry. According to the union, nurses in the province are the lowest paid in the country. It says there are 5,800 registered nurses and nurse practitioners, and there are 750 vacant positions. The Roddickton Bide Arm area on the northern peninsula was blasted with heavy rain over the weekend. Farther south in Sally's Cove, three generations were forced from their home when a partially blocked culvert flooded a basement with five feet of water. Marilyn Roberts says she's now sorting through the ruins. Uh, my water pump and tank, my deep fridge and all of my frozen food. I'm not sure on my wooden aisle furnace yet. And they had to cut my power, so I had no power running into my house. I had no telephone line. I have nothing right now. Yeah, there was lots of rain recorded on Saturday, about 67 millimeters for uh, areas along the west coast. Today, another 13 millimeters, bringing the total up to nearly 80. And there is lots more on the way, especially uh, towards the west coast. As you can see, lots of showers already, thanks to a stationary front. And if I zoom in a little bit, you can see uh, some of the showers embedded are a bit heavy at times. And that will continue generally as we head through the night tonight. Environment Canada uh, does have a rainfall warning in place, but this is what you're looking at. By the time we get into Wednesday morning, uh, totals between 50 and 75 millimeters on top of what's already fallen. Some of us towards eastern Newfoundland will see that as well. Uh, but generally, yes, it will be a wet couple of days. We'll get into all the forecast details when I come back. Thanks, Ashley. Well, a body was found in St. John's Harbor on Saturday morning, though police do not believe the incident to be suspicious in nature. Coast Guard put out a May Day alert over the weekend when the fire department was alerted to the body. A supply ship responded to the call and recovered a deceased man. According to the RNC, an investigation is underway. And a warning for some new Natsiavut communities. Testing has found oil contaminants in eggs and Arctic char around Postville and Nain. Health Canada is advising consumption limits for gull, duck, and pigeon eggs. And the amounts range depending on a person's age and their location. The new Natsiavut government says the levels don't raise immediate concern in the short term, but long term could cause a slightly higher risk of cancer. Scientists have also found diesel related compounds in Arctic char. Higher levels were found in Postville uh, compared to Nain. The results are still being analyzed, but according to Nunatsiavut, the char isn't as concerning as the eggs. Community-specific data is being gathered for the other Labrador Inuit communities, and Natsiavut is recommending people use the consumption guidelines for either Postville or Nain in the meantime, whichever is closer to where you live. This monitoring began following a 3,000-liter diesel spill near Postville in 2020, though Natsiavut says the contamination can't be linked to a single event and could have multiple sources. A well, controversial statue is still standing across from Confederation Building in St. John's, and some Indigenous activists want to know why. There have been calls over the years to remove the statue of Gaspar Court Riel. Summer intern Arlette Lazarenko brings us this update. If you're driven or walked along the parkway in St. John's, you might have come across this guy. 
He's been standing at this spot for 60 years, but who is he? No, no, I'm not familiar, really. Do you know this statue? No, I don't. I do not uh, recognize this person. Who is this person? The statue is Gaspar Corste Real, a Portuguese explorer back in the 1400s. Historians say he enslaved indigenous people, so why is there a statue of him, and why here? Short answer, propaganda. In 1965, Portugal was under a dictatorship. The Corte Real statue was a gift to the province as part of an effort to improve Portugal's international reputation. For many indigenous people, the sight of this statue is as painful as a fresh wound. Jude Benoit and Robert Lehman are both Mi'kmaq and activists. To see the harmful statues is to be reminded um, that uh, my government quite, quite bluntly does not care. That's why I see it as an act of harm every single day, is that um, every day people look at it and don't think, hey, we should remove that because that is celebrating a very violent history. Two years ago, the provincial government created a working group that would decide on the future of this statue. It says in a briefing note earlier this year that there are three potential options. The first option is to move the statue to a more accessible location, adding the history that you just heard. Second option is to add the historical context, but leave the statue where it is. Third option is to store the statue until they figure out what to do with it. I personally would like to see the statue removed and replaced with uh, something that we can really honor in Indigenous history because we have a lot of really beautiful people in Indigenous history that could and should be celebrated. If there is still value in telling the Court Real story uh, and the history of the statue and why people needed to remove it, um, then it's more appropriate to maybe put it in a museum or, or put it in the rooms or put it in, uh, uh, put it in that type of context. The provincial government say they haven't reached a decision just yet about the statue. For Benoit and Lehman, they say they heard that line before and just like the statue, it's getting old. Arlette Lazarenko, CBC News, St. John's. Canada Day in this province starts a little differently than in other parts of the country. We mark Memorial Day first. It's a time to remember the Battle of Beaumont Hamill and those lost in World War I. More than 700 Newfoundland Regiment soldiers were killed or wounded on July 1st in 1916. And on Saturday, hundreds gathered at the National War Memorial in downtown St. John's to pay their respects. I'm lucky I'm here. My father was in the 1st Regiment, 1st World War, and, but it was invalided out, in, out after Gallipoli and spent many months in the hospital before sending, being sent back here to St. John's. He missed Bowman Hamill, and uh, so that's why I'm here. He survived, so I'm one of his children. All those people that died in Bowman Hamill, I, I, I think of them because it could easily have been my father, but so I, I, I'm grateful that, you know, that uh, these people went over the top without thinking. They didn't stop. They went there. They were, they were told to go, and they went. But they made a big sacrifice. It's a very important day um, to us as, a, as an organization, to everybody in particular, because it was the day that uh, the Newfoundland Regiment suffered heavy casualties in the Battle of Beaumont Amel, and the association in general had uh, a large number of members of its members serve uh, that day in the battle. So it's very important uh, as Newfoundlanders to come out today to respect what they did for us to be here today. As an amateur historian, I was just re reflecting on everybody that, uh, you know, the soldiers that served that day, you know, the losses that they, you know, that they suffered was just uh, astounding. We had representatives here who laid a wreath for the organization. We're going to try and uh, keep up the tradition here. It's just great to see everybody out today that possibly could be out to uh, respect, respect those that suffered that day and, uh, and keep remembering where your papi. In Ottawa this weekend, tens of thousands took part in Canada Day celebrations to mark 156 years since Confederation. About history, 
People have looked to Canada as an amazing place, but increasingly now, people are coming to Canada to proudly call it their home and build their lives and our communities and our country all together. The event kicked off with a moment of reflection for Indigenous communities. Also, 17 new citizens were sworn in as part of the ceremony, and there were musical performances as well. A larger celebration planned for the evening was put on hold, though, after a severe thunderstorm warning and a tornado watch were issued. Meanwhile, back in this province, a few dozen people attended an anti-Canada Day event in St. John's on Saturday. The second annual Land Back Fest was held in Bannerman Park. Organizers say the event is a protest against Canada's colonial history, but it's also a gathering for Indigenous people to celebrate themselves and help each other heal. Uh, Land Back Fest, the importance of doing it today uh, is so that people have another option and that we can celebrate anti-colonial, uh, anti-comp, anti-Canada, uh, indigenous resistance and resilience um, that uh, doesn't always have to be angry and sad because we're, we're feeling those things uh, and we're expressing those things in a bunch of ways every day. Um, but on a day that already carries so much pain, we thought it was uh, in a, a helpful uh, and joyful thing for us to be doing in community uh, just to get together in the park, have some food, uh, open the mic for anybody who wants to uh, have that type of healing space conversation, share a drum, share a song. Well, members of the Sudanese community protested in St. John's over the weekend. About 30 Sudanese Newfoundlanders gathered on the steps of City Hall. They're looking for answers in the death of Omar Mohammed, who was shot and killed by police on June 12th. Mohammed was a former child soldier in Sudan and had mental health issues. The Sudanese community has been calling for more police transparency. It took more than two weeks for the province's serious incident response team to confirm Mohammed's identity. We are protesting what happened to him because is, uh, all the Sudanese community are very concerned about what uh, happened to him and that's why we are protesting to show our frustration, to show that we are not accepting what is happening. We're looking for a multiple answer, you know. One of the answers we need to know why he has been killed, why the police use this excessive force with him. Uh, and we need to know also about uh, his body, where could we be able to bury him according to our uh, Islamic tradition. And we need to uh, know more about the case, why he had been killed and what is the reasons behind that. Well, former politician and judge William Marshall has died. It's exactly the same thing that I offered two years ago. Next. If that was true, then why did it take Bill Marshall and I eight months to do this? Was... <laughs> now, what he said tonight was a complete and absolute fabrication that should have and could have been exposed very easily by somebody who was interviewing who knew the history of the situation. In his later years, Bill Marshall served as an appeals judge in this province, but in the 1970s and 80s, he was a cabinet minister, president of the executive council, and minister responsible for energy negotiations. He spent years tussling with then-federal minister Jean Chrétien, like back in 1985, when the province finally reached an offshore energy deal with Ottawa. Bill Marshall was 87 years old. To the West Coast now, Corner Brook is getting a new recreation center. The $25 million project was first announced in 2020. The facility is built on an existing structure on Memorial's Grenfell campus, and construction is almost complete. Here now is Colleen Connors got an exclusive look inside. The entrance to the new regional recreation center may not look like much just yet. But inside, the new pool is really coming together. Uh, so we're overdue. Uh, a city our size needs a modern aquatic center, and this is it. The former university pool closed in 2015. It needed major restoration work. This new center is utilizing some of the campus infrastructure. I'm very happy to say that that, that, in, that original footprint is still there, but it's being replaced with a you know, modern technology as well. That room is expanding far toward the, the rear of Grenville campus uh, to include a therapeutic pool, lazy river, uh, you know, a, a beach entry. Even a water slide and family change rooms. Construction is about 70% complete. 
Students at the campus will have access, so will people living in Cornerbrook and surrounding communities. Across the hall, a new child care centre with infant rooms and an outdoor playground with 30 spaces available. Which is desperately needed. Anyone who's had to deal with childcare in the last few years knows how hard it is to find, uh, find quality daycare. The centre will have a full gymnasium, upstairs a fitness centre and multi-purpose room. The $25 million project funded by the city, province and the federal government is about a million dollars over budget right now. But the city says that's to be expected with such a large build. Construction did not start on time. There were some issues with the initial contract with the university. Now the big question now is when is this recreation centre going to open to the public? When can the swim team start practicing? And when will that daycare open to the public? Well, the contractors hope to be finished with their work by the end of 2023. If all goes well, that's hopefully. And the mayor says that it should be opened for use in September of 2024. Colleen Connors, CBC News, Corner Brook. Have a look at this. Video producer and drone operator Danny Arsenault captured this incredible footage earlier today. Just a gorgeous day out there. It's the Hercules oil rig stationed off of Bay Bulls. You may have seen it from the shore. Now getting a lovely bird's eye view of that structure. Just a gorgeous day out there today. Yeah, gorgeous day as far as sunshine is concerned in some places. There's a lot of rain on the way though, especially uh, towards the west. We'll talk about it when I come back.
Well, many people are sparking up the barbecue on this holiday long weekend, and that sparked a debate here in our newsroom over a summer grill staple. Would you consider a hot dog a sandwich? CBC Sarah Entel went out in search of that answer. Oh, is a hot dog a sandwich? It's bread and meat. And you put the bread and then the bread and everything else is in between. It's a sandwich. A hot dog? No. Why not? No. No <laughs> way. Not in a sandwich. It is filling with bread on either side. On three sides even. That's like extra sandwich. Yeah, of course. Like what are the options? What else, what else would it be? Do you think that a hot dog is a sandwich? Absolutely, and I've had this debate before. I'd have to say no. I think it's the hardest question I've ever been asked in my life. <laughs> a hot dog is sort of like a, a three-sided sandwich. You know, the bun comes from the bottom and the sides. I do think that a hot dog is a sandwich. I think it meets all the criteria. It's surrounded by bread. It's got meat. It's got vegetables if you if you really stretch the concept of ketchup. I think it's a sandwich. It's a different form. It's an old form that is, uh, God, I don't, I don't know. I don't think it's a sandwich. Why not? Because it's a single piece of bread. It's got to be cut in two. All right, thank you. You're very welcome. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> That's pretty good. I love how, you know, deeply they were contemplating that question. It, it's, it is a good one, though, when it's you think question. about it. What I'm, do you think? I have never been asked that question, I've nor have really I ever thought about, thought it. about it. <laughs> I, I guess it would be a sandwich. I guess so. Is anything in between bread, bread. sandwich? Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Good question. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Bit of foolishness on this uh, long holiday weekend. Yeah, yeah. that's all um, good. Yes, and so we're going to look at the weather now. Mm -hmm. People are heading back to work, for those who are off today anyways, heading yeah. back to work tomorrow. How are things looking? Well, it's a good week, uh, end of the week, I should say, to go back to work because mm -hmm. uh, it's going to be a little bit wet. Oh. Um, we're we're going to see lots of rain out there. Uh, today, not so bad, though, especially the further east you go. Now we are seeing some rain in the west, but here's looking at your temperature today. Very summer-like, 25 degrees in St. John's this afternoon, 23 in Gander. Unfortunately, again, along the south coast, which is typical in the summer, we see the cooler temperatures with uh, fog and drizzle, but only 13 degrees in Burgio, Cape Race, Porta Basque. But then up across Labrador, 27 degrees in Lab City, 27 degrees in Happy Valley, Goose Bay, and same thing for Cartwright. So there's lots of heat out there this afternoon. You factor in that humidity, though. Uh, feeling more like 32 in Happy Valley Goose Bay. Bit of humidity along the west coast as well. 27 in Corner Brook this afternoon and feeling more like 29 in uh, Deer Lake. And right now it feels like 30 in St. John. So certainly lots of humidity there. How long is this going to stick around? Well, certainly as we head into Tuesday, there you go. The dew point 20 degrees and uh, that is uh, it's very, very humid, but we still have some drier conditions towards coastal areas of Labrador, Northern Peninsula as well. And as we head into Wednesday, you can see that humidity pretty much sticking around. It'll dry out a little bit in Happy Valley Goose Bay, and then it will move right back in as we head in towards the end of the week. Uh, still about 17 degrees in St. John. So that means we'll still see uh, it'll still feel a little bit sticky and, uh, Really, that's the story as we head into Friday and even into Saturday. So for those of you that are asking where the humidity is going, not very far, it looks like at this point. So here's a, a shot at what's happening right now. We've got uh, a lot of moisture associated with the, along this trough here, pulling it in from actually the tropics uh, at the moment. And then we've got a cold front that's in fact sparking some thunderstorms up across parts of Labrador. So around Cartwright area, don't uh, be too surprised to see a few rumbles of thunder, but the most of Labrador is under clear skies. And that means you'll be able to see the full moon tonight. It's a buck moon. And the reason why it's called that is because the antlers of male deer are generally in full uh, growth mode at this time. And it's also a super moon, which means it's between 7 and 14 percent bigger than normal. So if you do get a chance to see the full moon tonight, this is the start of four super, man, super moons in a row. So uh, a fairly nice treat across the island. 
not going to see it uh, as the showers are going to work their way through. Lots of them, some of them embedded already will be fairly heavy and that's really the story as we head through the night tonight. So Environment Canada has a rainfall warning in place. Green Bay, White Bay, uh, Gross Morn down towards Port of Ask and including Deer Lake at this hour. And uh, like I said, that rain will continue. So here's a look at it. Heavy at times through the overnight. Parts of Central will start to see some periods of rain after midnight. And then the Avalon will generally see some showers tonight. Uh, you won't really see the periods of rain until we get into the early morning hours tomorrow. Temperatures tonight not really moving much either. Still into the teens, uh, 16 in St. John's overnight tonight. Across Labrador, generally into the teens as well, except towards the coast where your temperatures will be sitting into the single digits. Rain tomorrow really continues. You'll start to see a clearing trend or at least ending, as I should say, uh, into the afternoon hours on Tuesday. That rain will linger for the Avalon. Eventually, by the time we get into Tuesday evening, we should be done with the rain and then uh, some more periods of rain will move in for eastern Newfoundland as we head towards Wednesday morning. Quiet weather up across Labrador, just uh, some drizzle and fog retreating to the coast for uh, southeast. Now, as far as temperatures are concerned tomorrow, a little cooler, generally around 21 degrees for St. John's. Uh, same thing towards the coast, but somewhere between uh, upper teens, low 20s, cooler towards uh, the south coast as uh, you sit in southern uh, southerly flow. And then for Labrador, another hot day in Lab City, 28 degrees with plenty of sunshine. Again, cooler though as you head towards the southeast, and that's because you are in onshore flow. That's your forecast. We'll take a look at the long range when I come back. Thanks, Ashley. Well, a couple from California is camping in this province this week, and they're doing it in a bit of an unconventional way. Mark Hall and his wife have been traveling across North America with a Tesla towing their camper. CBC video producer Mark Cumbie caught up with Hall during a stop in St. John's. <music> My name is Rick Hall and I'm a former programmer for a bank. I worked in San Diego. I live in San Diego. Both of my wife and I retired in December. We emptied our house that we've been in for I think around 30 years. We moved out permanently and we are on the road. We're traveling and we're, we're uh, seeing the world. We, we've traveled from San Diego through the southern U.S. Uh, we're leaving Galveston and we're headed into Louisiana. We even camped in New York City. Who does that? We camped in Brooklyn, uh, right there on the Hudson River. And uh, here we are in uh, Newfoundland and, and just loving it. What a wonderful place. Ain't she sweet? See you coming down the street. And they ask you very complicatedly. Ain't she sweet? I've always liked to travel. I've visited 36 countries so far. and. In retirement, we thought it'd be nice to spend a year or so traveling around North America. So we wanted to do that, though, in an environmentally friendly way as possible. So uh, we figured out a way to tow a trailer behind an electric car. And uh, I guess that's kind of unique. <laughs> There's not too many people doing that. I get a lot of uh, surprised looks at the even at the charging stations and uh, in the campgrounds. We love teaching people about EVs because we really think that it's an important step toward preserving the, the, the earth and keeping it habitable uh, to slow down climate change. This is a big issue for us. We have to do whatever we can.
It took more than a month to paint and takes up an entire gallery space at the rooms. But when this exhibition ends, it will be gone forever. We're talking, we're about to take you inside Inuk artist Glenn Gear's newest creation, a visual landscape that's larger than life. As an Inuk artist, it's important that we create spaces where we can challenge ourselves, spaces that are, I think, more interesting in terms of uh, contemporary art. I mean, we'll always have the sculpture and the printmaking, but I think any need art, contemporary art right now, is so much wider than that. My name is Glenn Gear, and I'm a multidisciplinary artist. And we're here right now in an installation that I'm uh, putting together uh, for the rooms. I've spent the last uh, three, almost four weeks painting this large installation. There are two hands that kind of uh, come up and they're sort of gesturing in a kind of reverential sort of way in a pose, an opening pose of a string game like Cat's Cradle. And much of my work is based in Nunatsiavut and in uh, knowledge of the land. And some of the, the star maps are based on Inuit cosmology from the region. Tell me about this piece that's right behind us. I'm, I'm hypnotized by it. And when I start looking at the, uh, the projection, I just can't stop looking. Oh, what is oh, it? Oh, thank you. So um, basically, I photographed some of my own beadwork and then I took those photographs into a program and made them into a moving kaleidoscope. So I wanted to open up a, a kind of a kaleidoscopic beaded portal and uh, through the portal, uh, this ancestor, um, which is linked to the caribou and caribou antlers, sort of emerged out of it. Now, the other thing is that you've painted this mural directly on the walls of this gallery space. So what happens when the exhibition is over? It gets painted over. So oh! it's <laughs> um, I, I'm, I'm okay with that. It's, it's sort of like a labor of love. And what makes it special is that it's not gonna be around forever. It'll be up for six months, which is, you know, a good run. What do you hope people get out of experiencing this exhibit? I think uh, when, when they come in and they see the scale of this mural in black and white, hopefully it's very inspirational, hopefully it's a, a space of reflection, and maybe they can think about the land and think about the disappearing caribou herd. So it's really about shaping the space and creating a place of contemplation and reflection on the land and the people. Well, from one impressive art form to another, a local glass company isn't afraid to break with tradition and get a little funky. Last week, we brought you to Mobile on the southern shore, where couples will soon be able to get hitched in a Vegas-style wedding chapel. Now, the focal point of that chapel is a custom-made stained glass window featuring the king of rock and roll. We spoke with the people who made it. SGO Designer Glass has been doing work for the last 20 years and we do a lot of residential work. But every now and then a project comes along that is just so much fun and this was That's just beyond belief. One of them, yeah. It really is. Brenda called us two or three months ago and she mentioned she had the little white chapel in mind. And we said this is such a cool idea, we had to be part of this. So uh, Gillian worked tirelessly on, on, on an Elvis design. Not wanting to duplicate something that's already been done, we wanted to come up with something truly original, and uh, you know, she knocked it out of the park. I love a challenge, certainly. <laughs> she does. She does. I also love using as much design and as much color as possible, <laughs> so that really worked well um, for this panel. Peacocks, of course, are all those beautiful peacock colors. But we did add in um, some purple for Elvis's love of purple and all things sort of royal and regal. The top yellow part is uh, kind of a nod to some of those original details at the original Little White Chapel. Behind Elvis's head, we did, uh, again, kind of an homage to the Graceland Gates 
with the music notes on it. The roses, of course. We had to ha add in some roses because he does love roses. And his guitar. So we did look up lots of photos to try to get uh, the perfect style and perfect colors. And his eyes, same thing. We looked up so many pictures of Elvis to try to match that perfect blue eye color. So yeah, I think we did a good job with that too. <laughs> There you go. By the time we, we tweaked everything and fine-tuned everything, probably dealing with close on 20 hours design time. Then we have to cut the materials and lay them down, you know, the fabrication process, and then it's the cleaning after, which takes about six hours. So I guess, you know, in total, probably looking at close on 100 hours. Doing any iconic figure like this in stained glass it does present a real challenge. We want people to know right away when they look at it, who they're looking at. It's like, oh, that looks somewhat like him. But I think this one is probably head and shoulders in terms of the fun factor for yeah. us, right? It was great. It was really a pleasure to work on. Their reaction in particular is amazing. Probably the best we can hope for, That's certainly. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's so nice to see the clients happy and uh, kind of go through that whole process with them. That's always the best part of the process is when, you know, the reveal when yeah. it goes in. The reaction was fantastic. We just we just love it when they're so happy. Yeah. yeah. I actually came yesterday and I got this little sad crying clown. But it wasn't all sad clowns. St. John's was buzzing this weekend with the sound of tattoo guns. We'll take you inside that popular convention just ahead.
The seventh annual tattoo convention is just wrapping up. For the past three days, the Remax Center in St. John's has been buzzing, quite literally. About 75 artists from across the country were here to give people fresh ink. Have a look. It's the reality of bringing so many different people from so many different places to our city and getting to share the aspects of our city uh, with them and have people from the city share the aspects of it with them. This is our seventh trip here. Uh, initially we came the first year because I'd never been to Newfoundland. And then once we got here, the, everyone was so lovely. Uh, the organizer's a great guy and it was just fun, so we, we had to come back. As popular as tattooing has become, there's still people out there that only think of, you know, an old anchor or a ship and don't realize that you can do photorealistic color portraits, uh, you know, geometric designs. It's just, so we're, we're still, you know, sort of publicizing our art, our craft and the possibilities. And there's also a learning side to this and a socialization with, you know, our, our co-artists, our co-creators in this industry. Tattooing has become a little more homogeneous now where you used to be able to recognize styles from different countries and whatnot. Now it's sort of all blended together. So you can get, you know, just as good tattooing in St. John's as you can in Toronto or Ottawa. I actually came yesterday and I got this little sad crying clown. Um, but then today from Monica back here, I got a little exorcist baby. To have people come from away and be, have that opportunity to get something not from here is like really cool to me. So many people have so many different prints and shirts and all this merch and stuff and you just get to see everybody's creativity and I just love that it's like broadcasted in one building. People are brought to tattooing for points of exuberation or points of misery or just because they feel drawn. Uh, to the actual idea of being tattooed at that moment. So every single person's got a very unique perspective on what got them to that place. And I mean, sometimes it's almost primordial, the urge to do something like get tattooed. But once you usually cross that line and you find yourself in a very different place with the concept of tattooing, the comfort and the community around it builds very, very easily. And uh, I think that's the most significant side of it, is, is that it is about community. And it's about, you know, networking and social structure for us. Crews in the Saguenay Lac St. John region of Quebec are still searching for two people swept away in a landslide on Saturday. On est toujours à la recherche d'une femme dans la quarantaine et d'un homme dans la quarantaine également. The Quebec Provincial Police say a man and woman, both in their 40s, are missing. Police say they're not from the area, about 260 kilometers northeast of Quebec City. Another man was also swept away, but he was rescued. The landslide was triggered by heavy rain. The nearby river had four times its normal flow. About 200 people were forced from their homes and helicopters rescued about 100 campers. Staying with weather-related news, it's cleanup time in central Alberta after a tornado touched down between the towns of Carstars and Didsbury on Saturday, sending residents running for cover. It's extraordinary. There's family farms that have been taken out that have been there for generations, um, and it's, it's heartbreaking. We're just grateful everybody's okay. We know stuff is just stuff. Two kilometers that way, there's a big subdivision, and a kilometer that way, there's a mobile trailer park, right? And it's amazing that none of that got hit, and it's amazing that the people that did experience this tornado weren't more um, injured than they were. Wow, more than a dozen homes were damaged, and at least five were reduced to rubble. The twister was on the ground for at least 20 minutes. Rebuilding, though, will be a big challenge for many people, especially those whose homes weren't insured. The biggest names in tennis began competing today at Wimbledon, where politics are also at play. This year's tournament will include athletes from Russia and Belarus. They've been barred after Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The CBC's Abby Kuathasin is at the All England Club and has that story. 
We're just outside the grounds. People have been milling past us all morning. Certainly a lot of excitement in the air, but there's a lot of controversy to talk about as well. Wimbledon's decision to reverse its ban on Belarusian and Russian players this year is certainly the talk of the town. They will now be competing as neutrals. They've signed neutrality agreements as well. And Wimbledon has decided to ban the sale of its merchandise in those two countries. Some players have also also spoken out about the war in Ukraine, the invasion of Ukraine. CBC News spoke with Billie Jean King, the tennis legend, about athletes using sports as a platform. We, we tell the WTA players, this will give you a platform. You have a chance to not only change yourselves and your families, but you have a chance to change your villages, your towns, your countries, because people look up to you, they see you, you're visible. Just as we did at the French Open, some Ukrainian players here at Wimbledon may refuse to shake hands with opponents from Belarus and Russia. Alina Svitolina, a Ukrainian player, has repeatedly said this is not about sportsmanship, but she can't go on as business as usual at tennis tournaments when her country is being invaded and people are being killed. Abby Kordas in CBC News, London. Well, check out this unique Canada Day tradition from Vancouver. These ferry boats are performing a synchronized ballet in False Creek. They usually bring passengers around Grenville Island, but on Canada Day, these boats bust a move. It's a tradition ferry operators have been pulling off for the last 30 years. We'll be right back.
Lots of people took to the water this past weekend for the start of the food fishery. But on this day, 31 years ago, fishing boats were coming off the water. Today marks the 31st anniversary of the Cod Moratorium, a monumental mark on this province's history. We dip into our archives now to watch an announcement that would forever shape the future of this province. <music> This is an amount that, the, uh, that we think should look after any emergency. John Crosby was facing an emergency almost from the time his news conference started. Hundreds of fishermen tried to break in. They had already heard what the fisheries minister was going to do, and they don't like it. But Crosby says anger or not, this is what he's going to do. He will shut down the northern cod fishery effective immediately. It will not reopen until the spring of 1994, and if the stocks don't improve, it could be longer. Fishermen have one week to get their nets out of the water. Fishermen and plant workers will be paid $225 a week by the federal government. This will continue for 10 weeks until a more extensive plan is devised. Crosby has not ruled out increasing the payments. While people wait for the fishery to reopen, there will be training programs to help upgrade technical skills. There will also be an early retirement program for those who want out. It will be accompanied by a licensed buyout program. Crosby thinks as many as 4,500 fishermen may choose to leave. The bottom line, says Crosby, is that too many people are trying to make it in the fishery. There are too many people now engaged in this fishery for them all to make an adequate income. Now, we're not proposing forcing anyone to do anything, but if we've got to have a moratorium for the next two years, this seems to be a chance to try to suit the resource and the number of people available, etc., to to more to the resource. It had been suspected that Crosby would deal with the Gulf fishery too, but he didn't. He says scientific evidence tells him the stocks aren't bad enough to shut it down. So, you know, we don't have any, any advice to the effect that we should stop the fishery for, in the Gulf. Now, the fishery has not been good, particularly for the fixed gear uh, fishermen, and we may have to take measures to assist them this year. Throughout the whole news conference, security officers fought to keep out the fishermen. Crosby's reaction? They don't need to go berserk, trying to batter on doors to frighten me. In the first place, I don't frighten, and I'm not going to be frightened. Red Sharon, CBC News, St. John's. I'm prepared. Wow, just classic. I love seeing those archival pieces. I've never seen that one before. That's, oh, really? Yeah, that's, yeah, the that's a good time. one. Yeah. John Crosby, my goodness. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so now we're going to have a look at the long range forecast, uh, and things are going to get a bit wet, you said earlier? Yeah, we're, uh, you know, we hadn't seen a whole lot of rain over the last little bit, but uh, a little bit of an unsettled pattern, certainly, as we head towards the end of the week. Uh, yeah, let's just see what's going on. There's your. Uh, future tracker. So this is Tuesday evening. We should see those showers um, move out, at least the bulk of the heavy rain move out as we head towards the early morning hours on Wednesday. Still lingering though, especially for southeastern Labrador, the northern peninsula, west coast, even parts of central, you still may see uh, some of those showers continue. But most of Labrador will be under lots of sunshine. It looks like the Avalon and uh, parts of Central will see some sunshine as well. Temperatures will generally be in the 20s, low 20s. Still looking at humidex values, though, in the upper 20s. West Coast, you're looking at your temperatures in the upper teens. Likely only around 12 or 13 degrees for the northern peninsula and along the Strait. Same thing for southeastern Labrador, but plenty of heat still across the big land. Lab City sitting at 29 degrees, 25 in Happy Valley, Goose Bay and Nain. You'll hover around 18 degrees. That's where all the sunshine will be. But temperatures along the south coast of the island, again, still in onshore flow. And that means that you will see some of those cooler temperatures. By Wednesday evening into Thursday, again, an area of low pressure, spinning lots of showers around. So generally unsettled day again with that chance of showers. I not overly heavy as far as rainfall totals are concerned, but you're still looking at that chance and they'll reach southeastern Labrador as well. So again, essentially a carbon copy as far as those temperatures are concerned and really the forecast now for Labrador, your temperatures even warmer. Lab City 
you should have around 32 degrees on Thursday and uh, Happy Valley Goose Bay will sit around 26. And again, along the south coast of the island, your temperatures will be into the teens. Now, the long range forecast really not moving too much as far as daytime highs are concerned for St. John's in eastern Newfoundland. You're looking at shower potentials for Thursday, Friday into Saturday. It looks like we'll some of the models anyway, pointing at a pretty nice weekend as so far. Let's see what happens, but I'm going to keep that sunshine in there for Saturday. Temperatures will be somewhere between 21 and 23 and overnight lows into the teens. For Central, you are looking at some showers pretty much across the board. Just a few on Saturday, though, with some peaks to sun. But for Western Newfoundland, it's looking a bit gray. Cooler, a little cooler anyway, from 19 to 22 is your daytime highs as well. And then for Eastern Labrador, nice stretch of weather as far as sunshine is concerned. Dry and hot, which is not great. Uh, we will likely see that fire risk high, but that's what you're looking at. And then for Western Labrador, a few showers Thursday and Friday uh, with temperatures around 30s. We could even see some thunderstorms with that. And uh, Saturday, you're looking at a temperature around 20. Just before we leave you, great shot here of Canada Day weekend in Fogo Island. Uh, thanks to Rich for that shot. If you have any, send them to Facebook, Twitter, or email them to nlphotos at cbc.ca. Oh, what a beautiful reflection. Nice, bright moon. Mm -hmm. Very nice. I just feel the bugs. <laughs> the bugs? <laughs> there like... were lots of bugs this weekend. Yeah, I have a few bites. <laughs> But it's the okay. price you pay for being outside when the weather is nice, right? Exactly. <laughs> well, that's it for us. Thank you so much for joining us. Good night.